This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery, and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? And welcome to this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? This week we have uh, part two of our interview with Mike Cleland about his new book, The Messengers, Owls, Synchronicities in the UFO Abductee. If you are a Patreon, you're getting to hear this show early because I conducted it on uh, oh, Monday, I think it was, Monday night, with Mike. As well as some extra stuff that will be up for patrons only. And if you want to be a patron of the show and help us out, if you like the show, for only three bucks a month, you'll get extra bits, you'll get, uh, well early interviews. So uh, you don't have to, if we do a multi-part interview and it's pre-recorded, you will get both parts at once. Or all three. We have done at least one three-part interview. Um, the next set of interviews, if all goes well, will be with Jeffrey Kripal, and that will probably be at least two parts, talking about his new book with Whitley Strieber. And again, patrons will get that uh, in its entirety right off the bat rather than having to wait two weeks to hear the whole interview. So, there are no specific uh, patron-only interviews, but you do get extra bits. I'll, uh, I have extra little pieces here and there with uh, different people after we uh, do the main interview. And you get multi-part interviews, if they're pre-recorded, all at once. All right. So, remember we have a forum if you want to join the forum and discuss whatever you want in the forum, go right over to wheredidtheroadgo.com. As well, we have uh, a group on Facebook, not only a page to like, but an actual group on Facebook where you can uh, discuss different things. So talk to us. If you have any stories, any weird stories you want to share, uh, you can send them to stories at wheredidtheroadgo.com. And uh, you can find all different ways to contact us at wheredtherogo.com, including that address. And if you want to share any stories, eventually we'll do a listener story stories show sometime in the near future. A few people have sent me stuff, and a few have asked when the next one's going to be. So feel free to email me in those stories, and we'll include them in the next show that we do like that. All right. With no further ado, this is Mike Cleland, part two of my talk with him. So I welcome back Mr. Mike Cleland. How you doing, Mike? Very good. Very good. And this will be part two of the, your interview on your book, The Messengers, because it was too much to fit in one interview. It is a big mess in a way to try to jam it into, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, there's no easy answers. So, um, yes, it was difficult to fit into an hour and a half. And, and no matter how long we go, we could talk all night. And, and I still think we'd have trouble fitting it all in. Well, sure, sure. Yeah, and that's why people need to buy the book. Yes. And they, yeah. and they definitely get their money's worth. You have, a, what is it, 400 pages almost? Just almost 400. Just a little bit shy. 390 something. Yeah. So it's, it's, and it's, there's no filler here. <laughs> if anything, you took stuff out. There's a few, you know, it's funny. There's a few chapters in there that I kind of reread and kind of look through when I'm skimming through it. Cause I keep it, I, it's funny. I keep it on the coffee table nearby and I kind of just like, like, you know, I'm kind of shocked I actually pulled it off, you know, and I pick this thing up and I'm like, well, let me just open this anywhere. And I'm like, hey, I forgot about this story. This is really interesting. Yeah, wait, oh, that's right. This happened. And and uh, and uh, there's a few chapters in there, like the pop culture chapter um, kind of needed to be in there. You know, you kind of have to address the pop culture thing. And and uh, and then I look at it and I was like, in, in retrospect, I hold the book in my hand now that it's published. I was like, was that filler? Did it need to be in there? I guess it did. You know, could it have been shorter? But um, 
So, well, you talked about you talked about Twin Peaks, and that makes most people happy. I talked about Twin Peaks, yes. I, and there's a few things I simply had to address because because everyone asks about it. I actually talked about the Big Owl on on uh, uh, in Bohemian Grove, you know, too, because everyone yes. was just yes. like, yeah, like, oh, you're going to talk about the Big Owl in Bohemian Grove, right? Owls, conspiracies, yeah. So I, I um, boy, you want to go into like a bottomless rabbit hole, you know? Start inter- yeah. start start researching. Uh, bohemian grove on the internet you know it's like yeah forget yeah, that yeah, just right into the reptiles and you know eating babies and stuff like that so <laughs> well when you have no proof either way it's very easy to to jump to conclusions and, or fill in the blanks with whatever you want to believe as it, uh, yes yeah exactly and then also if you're you know people who had the ufo contact experience right now people who've seen a ufo right so the government says there's no such thing as ufos right so you 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 driving along you see a flying saucer clear as day vivid doing impossible maneuvers flies off right I mean, the whole thing lasts three seconds your life has changed forever because then you know you listen to the government say there's no such thing as ufos and you know full well they're wrong they're lying because you have firsthand experience of just the opposite so there's there's a there's a population out there i don't know what it is i mean some people just throw the number 10 percent around it's probably higher than that um that uh you know that that are you know, once you're, once the government's lying about UFOs, you know, what else are they lying about? So you're, you're, it's kind of an, yeah. you know, the, the, the UFO experiencer is primed for being a sucker for the weirdest conspiracies out there. So the, um, and I, and I think with the government, they're going to lie to whatever takes it to their advantage, period, mm-hmm. no matter what it is. You can just assume the government lies. It, it's, it's a safe bet. Because they're gonna get they're gonna spin whatever it is to get the most out of it. Exactly. Yeah. It, it may not be because they're being you know because they need to hide anything so much as what can we make this how how can we make this more of an advantage to us? Exactly, and that's where this you know like when people say oh this disclosure is going to happen and I'm like well, good grief if there's disclosure it is going to be like you know layer upon layer upon layer of disinformation that's going to be you know set up in a way to to serve some agenda you know so yeah yeah and uh i don't know that the government does the government necessarily say there aren't ufos i mean the official word on it was project blue book and what they said is that ufos do not represent a threat to national security and and they also yeah but it's basically the the they're the, they're towing the line in essence where you know this is you know whatever there's all kinds of stuff right now with hillary clinton that you could you know that's just this teaser stuff that I don't know I, I can't imagine it's going to go anywhere but um uh y- yeah you know so but I mean in essence they're saying you know you ignore the man behind the curtain yes yeah and politicians are going to say whatever thing they think is going to get them more votes so I mean that doesn't amount to much generally yeah um but yeah I mean and then the thing is if the government realizes how weird this phenomena really and is. And they must. They absolutely must realize that. If they, if they you know, get a room full of thinking people to study it for a week, they're going to come up with that. Yeah. And if that's the case, and, and people are still looking at this as a simple nuts and bolts type of thing, how do you even release that if you wanted to? Exactly. And you know, you know what happens if, when, the, if, when you release it and the first person who raises their hand in the press conference says, what about all those people who say they've been taken from their bedrooms, you know, like at night? So how do you answer that? Then, yeah, I mean, you have to define if they're actually taken, taken, or is it an altered state of consciousness, or what's really going on? It would be, a, it's going to be a mess if it ever happens. So Yeah, and I mean, I, I don't, and they may, they may not know any more than we do. I, I yeah, suspect just, they have more than a file cabinet full of information. I'll just yeah, that, yeah, but you, but you f- you figure okay, if it was nuts and bolts aliens coming here and they had captured crafts and stuff, yes, then they probably would know more than the general public. But if this is what it seems like it is, which is something very liminal, very in between, like internal and external reality, then what could they have that would give them an advantage? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, or the or the other thing is, is you know, I mean, I, my on my sense is that you know that the the uh, all the cards are being held by the UFO occupants. Yeah, that they've, I'm suspect they've. Hmm, I mean, I don't know. I just have a feeling that there's it doesn't serve anyone's interest 
to release this information in any kind of formal way. Um, and if, if it's going to happen, you know, it's going to be the UFO occupants who are going to make the splash. Yeah. And if the government releases anything, it's not going to be anything other than some level of disinformation or stuff that just perpetuates what we, what a lot of people already think it is. Yeah. You know, without any like definitive anything. Exactly. Um, one of the obviously one of the things in this book is uh the way synchronicities figure into all of this. And this you know, when you talk owls and UFOs, you have a very physical thing you could you could at least point at. But with synchronicities, it's something so intangible, but so I mean, especially with some of your experiences, so obvious that it's impossible to get away from. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's like the thing is that you can't, you know, like I had to put synchronicity right on the front of the cover. You know, there's another, have you interviewed, um, Robin Trish McGregor? They did a great book called, um, aliens in the backyard. And that also has the word synchronicity right on the cover. I don't think so. I think you've told me about them. Yeah, they're great. They would do a great interview and that book's really good. It came out a few years ago and they, I think they've, they've got another one called, um, synchronicity highway. And that like, I think one third of the book is on the UFO thing and they've, you know, so they're Mm -hmm. doing what I consider really very competent investigative journalism into this stuff. And they're both good writers and stuff like that. And they're kind of workaday writers. And so it's got this very, uh, you know, clean way that book is presented. But anyway, they, yeah, they, they put synchronicity right on the cover of a couple of their books on UFOs. And I'm like, well, dang, I'm going to do it on mine too. You know? So, um, <laughs> and no, in part of just cause it's like, that is what got me in the door, so to speak, you know, was synchronicity. I mean, it was owls and synchronicity that, that made my life, come unhinged. I mean, I say this pretty clearly in the book. I mean, I nervous breakdown is too strong of a word, you know, that the events that, that began in 2006, you know, but between 2006 and 2010, I mean, I was, I was not functioning very well. I was so lost in this stuff and the synchronicities and the owl stuff were at a crazy high in those years. Um, yeah, I just, you know, there was a, I mean, I just felt like I couldn't keep up with it. You know, I just couldn't make sense of it. Um, and it just felt like it was day after day. And that's that blog from those years was, was me archiving these synchronicities, you know, and some of them had to do with owls and I, almost all of them seem to have a thread that tied back into the UFO thing. Hmm. See, I always look at synchronicities. If nothing else they're a, 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 like a signpost along the way saying you're going the right way. Even if the synchronicity itself doesn't mean anything. Yeah. It's almost like, okay, you're lined up with where you should be. Here's how you know. Exactly. And I mean, uh, Nick Redfern says that when he's doing you know, his research, if he doesn't have synchronicities showing up, um, you know, he recognizes that he's not he's not pulling the right threads in a way. You know, And, and when right. synchronicities do show up, um, you know, he knows he's on the right path with the research. And and I think that the, there's something about, I mean, I'm sure that there's, you know, plenty of other topics that can generate synchronicity. But I think that, you know, the more ethereal, I mean, the people on a, I, th- I say this in the book that um, a friend of mine, you know, like this is going back a few years. And I initially wrote a little essay, which was in a uh, the sync journal. I think it's called Stink Book One or Two. I think I was in. I can't remember. The, this guy, Alan Green, put this these books out and they're really interesting. And um, so I put a chapter out, which in one of these books, but you know, it was as I was kind of doing the research for the chapter, and it was fun to write. It didn't have to be too long. It was kind of a long blog post in a way. But um, the, uh, you know, I talked to a friend and I said, you know, UFO abductees have a little bit, they have more synchronicities than Joe Normal. I was kind of being snotty about how I said it, kind of holier than thou. And she looked at me and rolled her eyes and she said, anyone on a spiritual path is going to have more synchronicities than Joe normal. Yeah. And then it, you know, so you, so you, it's like just the next step in the, the, the thought process would be, well, that means UFO abduction is a spiritual path. And yeah. it, and it, and, and I have been addressing it in that way, um, in the research, you know, and, 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 you know, I'm as, I'm as, I am not 
objective, right? You know, I'm completely subjective. You know, I, I'm like, you know, you were talking, we talked a little bit before we came on the air, like, you know, some researchers, they just filter stuff out. I'm like, I'm the worst. You know, I do it. I mean, I'm filtering out anything that doesn't have anything to do with owls, you know, so that's all getting pushed to the side and, and that's all I focus on. So, you know, it's, you know, so I'm, I'm focusing on this little fractal, tiny outlying you know, almost insignificant part of the whole UFO thing. And, and what it, you know, and what I'm finding is there's a wealth to this, like, easily dismissed corner of the subject. There's a wealth to it that just boggles my mind. It just leaves me dumbfounded. But you're not filtering out things necessarily. You're looking at everything and going, does this have to do with what I'm looking at? No? Okay. Whereas some researchers will say, well, that's bunk because it doesn't fit the pattern I've already established. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. But in a, but I'm not being objective. I'm being. I feel like I'm being subjective. This is like it's the journey began oh. with my own owl experiences, and I and I'm I'm intertwined in the story of the book. I mean, I I'm I'm a, a character in the in the in the novel of the book in a way. And we're all subjective, though. I mean, that's all we have is subjective to work with. So yeah, and at least I'm whatever. I just I got to say that, and I say it a few times yeah. in the book. Yeah, yeah. So I got to be clear that I'm not. You know, I'm not. I'm not. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm completely enmeshed in the in the in the project. And and this is this is the thing that synchronicity thing also brings you around to the spiritual level of of UFO encounters and paranormal encounters. And I mean, you 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 mention a bunch of a bunch of very positive um, type of encounters and here things that have helped people uh, develop. But of course, there are all the negative ones, and people will always say, "Well, how can it be spiritual if it's negative?" But I think that's the whole point. I mean, sometimes, especially with the UFO thing, it's not something you seek out generally. It's something that just comes upon you for whatever reason. It decides you need to move forward, and that's where you have this UFO encounter. And if you're not willing, it could be very, very unpleasant. I mean, it would just be like you know taking an ayahuasca trip and fighting it. Yeah, or or I mean that's the that's the the um the shaman, no one volunteers to be the shaman. They are sort of chosen right. by the tribe and then they are like uh they go through an initiation whether they want to or not. And and uh um you know it's funny cuz I keep on quoting this little thing and I know I heard it somewhere and I cannot find reference for it, but I mean I heard this someone else say it and I'm quoting them in a way and and I can't so but the but the, they said and, and I have no idea whether this is true. It's close to being true because you can find examples of, of it. But, you know, the, the village elders would take the, the, the shamanic initiate, you know, out to the cave at the edge of the village and beat them to near death. Yes. And then, and, and if they survived, they would become the shaman. Now, I actually cannot find any reference for that, but I've heard that. I've heard that yeah, too. Yeah, I may, I may have said it, you know, but um, to you at, in one of the other interviews. But, um, but the, uh, but the, you know, so there's I don't I can't find that extreme example, but I can find plenty of examples, countless examples oh, yeah. of things almost to that degree. Just just a just a notch back from that. Well, a lot of shamans would have would be people who uh, came very close to death, or have have, have, have not died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, have actually crossed over, not only close, yes. but you know, actually entered the realm of the dead and then come back. Yeah. And so I I, I think. I think when we look at these lines between altered states of the shaman and the the abduction experience and, and all this stuff, I, I think the line really isn't there. They're pretty much the same thing with a different face on it. Yeah, yeah. That was the one chapter I really had to cut down. It was the shaman chapter, the shamanism chapter, because I just found so much great stuff. And yeah. it just was, I just, I just found, I was like, oh my God, I, I, I have about all, I've saved it all. And maybe there'll be a little essay or something I write that just fleshes out that chapter. But it was, um, you know, that once you start playing with this as a sort of thought experiment, you know, like, I mean, comparing it, which, which uh, I'm, this is, I'm not treading new ground. This is straight out of what, um, John Mack wrote in Passport to the Cosmos. But um, the the comparing and contrasting the uh, shamanic initiation to the UFO contact experience, you know, there's a little line in the book. I'm paraphrasing it from memory, but I was really happy with the. It had a nice ring to it, you know. Like, is the, you know, if the um, the shamanic initiate, uh, you know, is is, you know, what's the difference between the shamanic initiate and the in the UFO abductee? I mean, what you know, what happens when the guy gets abducted in Ohio? you know, and he works in the insurance 
office somewhere and he comes back you know what his what is his new role the same way that you know what is the the young uh you know villager after he's been taken through the initiation rites you know whatever that might be a death and rebirth thing might be as simple as a sweat lodge or something like that but but that's the that's the metaphor you know what is his new role when he comes back to the village as the anointed shaman and when you look at a lot of these secret societies, one of the things they do is to give you that whole death ritual, you know, to, to shed off your old self and, and bring in the new shelf self. And I, and I think, you know, th this stuff all goes back to shamanism. It's just it's lost some power because now it's just like going through the motions. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, there's there's shamanic you know, sh shaman is a very strong term. And I've actually asked people, you know, like, are you a shaman? And they'll say, oh, yes, I am. And I'm like, ooh. And then they'll say, you know, I really don't like broadcast that. I really, it's not really up to me to say that. It's up to, you know, so so there's this, you know, I mean, it's pretty rare that you, I mean, people have like a website where they say, you know, shaman, you know, I'll write on the, or, or most people, most of the folks that I've, it's funny, Tim Banal, I just did an interview with him, and I said, yeah, well, we need to talk to a shaman. And he's like, a shaman? Who talks to a shaman? And I'm like, well, you write a book about owls, you talk to them all the time, you know? So, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so I have interacted with a lot of people who, who tell of being shamans. And, uh, and it's hard to pin down, you know, like, what does that really mean? But yeah. like, there's like a shamanic, um, if people aren't out and out shamans, there's like shamanic like work. You know, I think Reiki healing is a perfect example. You know, you, if a Reiki yes. healer is not a shaman, but they are doing shaman like work. And there's a lot of Reiki healers in the stories. I mean, I just, I just yeah, blew yeah. me away. I mean, I just could not believe it. Just felt like I, I mean, I just, yeah. I mean, at this point, like I, you know, it's, I know it's not true, right? But I mean, I kind of like if someone tells me they're Reiki healer, the first thing the little bell goes off in my head is like, oh, they're an abductee, you know. So. <laughs> um, and and the thing is, people who have these experiences also tend to have abilities like healing abilities or psychic abilities, yeah. especially close into the the encounter. Not to mention poltergeist activity and all kinds of other stuff that again doesn't fit with that. Nuts and bolts. These are just ETs from another planet coming down. Type of uh, explanation. That's. I mean, I make the point. You know, uh, like over and over again. You know, so you have a UFO encounter. You know, close up. You have, who do you call? Do you call like Mufon? You know, and they're going to come and say like, oh, you know, what was the, how close was the craft? Do you, do you held a, you know, a quarter in your arm at arm's length. You know that. You know what time was it? You know which way was it traveling? And they fill out a little form and they walk away. Um, you know, or or is it better to call the shaman from the local Indian reservation, have them come in and, you know, ask, you know, like, what were you thinking right beforehand? What were you doing after? You know, how has your life changed? You know, what's your, what are your spiritual goals? You know, what, what, what part of you feels empty and missing? You know, these, these are the questions that I find really fascinating when you get down and in, into the, you know, get your hands dirty in this, in this kind of research. Well, I, I think with the whole UFO thing, the, the... I think trying to pursue it directly is never going to give us answers because it's not what it seems to be. And the only thing we can really focus in on are the effects it has on people. Sure. You know, that's, yeah. that is where you can see something significant and maybe, and maybe actually make some progress along the way because, you know, a million more UFO pictures aren't going to help us. Yeah. And I mean, it's very important. I mean, if you get a burn mark in the backyard, you know, to go ahead and take a tape measure and measure it and take a couple pictures sure. you know, do all that, yeah, that, that boots on the ground kind of thing. But, um, uh, but I agree. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, that's the, uh, oh, the, you know, people are, I mean, the, so what I've come away with, and I don't really say it in the book, but I've kind of like said it afterwards is like the, sh the, the owl is the totem animal of the transformative experience. I mean, I, I, I say as much in the book, but I, but I never say it that clearly and I feel bad and I probably should have said it that clearly. It's kind of after the book was published, it kind of got summed up in a way um, through the editing process of the book. But, but the, you know, the owl would be a, a representation of the, of the transformative of some transformative experience. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you deal with, uh, the idea that a lot of this stuff could just be coming from us as well, which is a, a perfectly valid idea as far as I'm concerned. 
And that gets a little bit tenuous. I mean, you know, what's us? What's the collective? You know, what's, you we know, what did you pick in a previous life? You know, what, it, what you know, what, what a, a, a agreement did you make before you entered this reality? I mean, all these questions are, are, you're forced to examine all these things. It's hard to answer any of them, but you're forced to ponder them. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, we know poltergeists come from the people that, you know, that are generally being affected by them. And yeah, uh, what's his name? Uh, well, let there when he wrote illuminations is, is speculating that UFO waves are, are like mass poltergeist effects. Um, you know, synchronicities have that, that sort of personal nature that sure it could be. I, I almost played, I, I think I might've put a blog entry up about this. Um, the idea that synchronicities and stuff like that are like your higher self playing a game with you where it can't quite step in and do something, but it can give you little signs and lead you along the way. And the signs can be so like perfect and so poetic. You know, I, I just think sometimes the signs are just like, you know, like if a, if you were a Hollywood script writer, man, you, you know, like some of the synchronicities are so clean and perfect in a way that, that like I would never would have the nerve to write them, you know, if, if they were fiction. Unreal. Yeah. 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 The uh, the first thing that came to mind is the one where you have the owl and the moon right behind the tree when you were laying down. And I was reading a book by an author. This name, his pen name is Seshari, and it was a, it was a book about global alignments. And uh, <laughs> you know, so there I am with a book about global alignments right there in my hand, and this this owl lines up. I mean, so the so there's a I did a, a, a rendering of it. I'm an illustrator, so it turned out pretty tidy. It was really simple to do because it's just basically a silhouette. But you know, I'm sleeping out under the stars, which I love to do. And I had a little Kindle with me. I didn't actually have a physical book, so I could read. Um, uh, you know, just by, I think it was actually a, a true Kindle where you had, I didn't, it wasn't a self illuminating thing. So I had a little headlamp on him in my sleeping bag. It's cold and it's high in the mountains in Wyoming. And, um, and the moon is rising spectacular. So cool. I knew it was going to be a full moon. So I was like, I gotta get out. I gotta sleep under the stars in this full moon. It's gonna be so cool. And, uh, and as I'm lying there, this, like all of a sudden this whoosh, thing flies right over me and it really makes me jump. You know, and then I, I I watch it, the motion of it, and this, you know, the moon's up, so there's you know plenty of you know light in the, and I watch this owl land on the tippy top of this tree, this dead tree, really close to me, actually the closest big tree. There might have been a couple of short spindly ones, but this was the closest big tree to me. It lands on the top of it and and just sits there for the longest time, and the way the moon was lined up was directly in line with the, you know, where my head was on the pillow. The, the moon was directly in line with the, uh, with, with that, 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 the, sh the, the trunk of the tree, the thin little trunk of the tree, but I wasn't much bigger than my arm. It was, a, it wasn't a thick tree at all. And then, um, now in that, the, and it occurred to me, like I had plenty of time. I sat in there and looked at it for a long time. And I was like, I was wondering whether the moon would move because it was another shorter tree nearby because the moon's going to move. Like if I watch long enough, if it moves to the next tree, will the owl jump to the next tree? It didn't. It flew away before that. <laughs> but um, it would have taken about a half hour to, 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 to watch it move like that. But in the few minutes that it was all aligned, I, I thought about, you know, this owl is looking at me and I have the shadow of the tree going right across my face. I don't know what that means, but that was exactly what the owl would have been seeing. So, um, but it seems like just kind of a perfect moment. It was so perfect. Yeah, it was so. And I was like, I literally like laid there and talked to it. I'm like, I think I said, like I asked it every question I could. I'm like, you know, what is the meaning of all these owls? How is it tied into the UFOs? What does it all mean? You know, I was basically like saying, if you can give me an answer, because I need it. And, um, uh, and obviously I didn't get any answer except to just to have the weird compulsion, you know, kind of the, the obsession to, to continue on with this, with this research. Yeah, what 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 was the thing that finally made you decide to write a book on this? You know what? It was? I, I actually I had been doing the blog posts, right? And then there came mm -hmm. a point, and I can't remember when it was. I figured, like, you know, I, I gotta I gotta just do a tidy essay, and I did this forty page essay, and um, and it was kind of as I was doing the essay and the end of it, I'm like, oh god, this is gonna be a book. I can tell. This is just, I got too much information here. I got more information than I know what to do with. So it's probably going to end up being a book. But the essay I published in, I think it was July of 2013, uh, less than three years ago now. And, 
and that's online. And that's, I think, when you and I spoke the first time was was all tied in. December that. 2013, yeah. yeah. So that would have been, a, you know, a few months after that, or, you know, five months or so after that was published. I had I had heard you on the Grelian Report talking with Micah, and I was like, wow, this, I mean, I just felt connections, even though my experiences are different than yours, I felt connections there listening to you talk yeah yeah it was just like yeah i need to have him on my show i need to talk to him well yeah and micah and i and micah's you know he's whatever he's kind of uh he can just go with the flow and he does he never uses notes when he does a radio show or anything like that so it's, it was a kind of freewheeling conversation but what was oh so and then the very first so if you you can go right back on the on the um and there's a long string of of uh comments on the blog post where i posted it was a pdf downloadable pdf the initial thing, which I think was just called Owls in the UFO abductee. Didn't get the word synchronicity plugged in there. And um, <laughs> and uh, and the first comment, the very first comment, I think, if it's not the first one, it's in the, within the first few, was from Nick Redfern. And he was like, you know, mate, this has to be a book. This has to be a book. <laughs> and I was just, I kind of knew that. And when he said that, I was like, yeah, I, I know. And so then the next, whatever, three years or two and a half years, I, I kind of consider the writing of that essay, the start of the book, because the, if you can, you know, all the puzzle pieces of that essay are in this book. So. Um, one of the things you bring up and, uh, I've talked about it on this show before is the connection between like depression and trauma and, uh, UFO encounters and stuff like that. Um, the, th the thing that that really kind of broke me out of the nuts and bolts model with Kenneth uh, was Kenneth. Yeah, Ring's I was going to say Kenneth Ring. Yeah, I never read that book. I have it on my shelf, and I've never read it. It's definitely worth reading, even today. Um, because what he did is he took the 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 after effects of people who had near death experiences and the after effects of people who were UFO abductees and found out that they were the same. Yes, and also the the pre effects in a way where where there's like what he I can't remember he would. With the term he used, and I'm just going back. There's encounter a prone, encounter prone personality. Yes, yes. There's a great um, audio. I actually have it's it's a YouTube thing, and I, it's on my blog somewhere. But it's an interview that's like a, uh, um, I think it was called Prognosis. They had like some you know, gnosis spelled with a G, and, and there was they were in Prague. And they had some symposium with thinkers and Kenneth Ring and Terence McKenna are kind of walking through this garden, you know, with like oh, yeah, yeah, the lily yeah. pads and stuff like that. And it's this amazing conversation. It's all of like ten minutes long, and it's just so great. You know, these two kind of riffing off each other, and they're both so smart, and they're both got just like such a you know wide view of this. But yes, I had never, you know like so that's one of the things that shows up in a way is that the people who have had these experiences have often had very difficult childhoods, you know, and I don't think I've quite fall into that though. I did have depression in, as a young adult, like severe clinical depression. Ah, yeah. See, I don't fall into that. I didn't have a traumatic childhood, but you know, it, it doesn't, it's not everyone. It's just that there's a, there's enough that you see that pattern repeat on and on that they were abused as children or had really rough childhood or were prone to depression. And I mean, why do you think that's the case? Why? I don't understand the why of it. All I know is that it, it seems to show up. I, I was spoke with, you know, I've spoken with all kinds of UFO researchers and there was a point when I would just be shameless and I would talk to these folks, you know, and I just figured a way to get a hold of them. So I talked to Bud Hopkins and Leo Sprinkle and David Jacobs and, uh, you know, Barbara Lamb and and a, and a few others, you know, where I would just be like, okay, and and I just there were, and it was so clear, you know, at a certain point I would say, listen, I've had this history of, you know, clinical depression, severe clinical depression, and they just nodded, you know, mm, you know, and you could just tell that like, like oh, like that's you've heard that before. You could they didn't say as much, you know, no one ever like you know said, well, you know, of course that. And then since then, I've done enough research to realize it's. And once again, it's not a hundred percent, but it's enough that there's a pattern there. But um, yeah. why? I mean, the, the one thought is that. Oh, and I'm not the psychologist, so I'm going to stumble on this. But um, <laughs> that the someone who's had trauma in their youth will disassociate will somehow disassociate. In an extreme case, they'll have two personalities, right? They'll have, right. In, a, in a less severe case, they'll just have the ability to disassociate from, from events. Um, and 
it's almost as if the UFO occupants are flying around, you know, and they kind of can see the aura of the individual, you know, and they're like got their little view screen and they're looking down at the people uh, and, and they, they, they notice one like, oh, that one's been, you know, had a disassociative event when they were a child, you know, like they're the perfect person that we need for our, for our agenda, whatever that agenda may be. Um, and I mean, that's, that's probably... I'm quite sure that's incorrect, but that's almost the sense I get. <laughs> well, I, w I would think maybe it opens people up to seeing things that uh, not everyone can see. The crack in the cosmic egg, yeah. I mean, they, yeah. they, they go through the dark night of the soul, and then they come out of it the other end somehow, you know, transformed. You know, I just, I got, I just remember I was, this was, this is not going to, I just remember, I mean, I had a, I, I mean, I've been very clear about this in all my writings and all my research and stuff like that. In in the winter of ninety two, ninety three, I had a, what amounted to a nervous breakdown, and um, and I came out of it. I feel like just the person I was before then. I like the person I am now so much better than the person I was leading up to that. You know, I was kind of tense and kind of uptight, and I still probably have that in me, but it's not nearly to the degree that I used to be. And it just it allowed me to be much more compassionate, much more sensitive to to certain issues, um, you know, very human issues, very personal issues. You know, I feel like I'm a better listener now than I would have been then before that. And I, uh, you know, I just remember like, like, God, uh, during the whole, like, you know, George Bush Jr. regime, I just remember just thinking like, you know, Dick Cheney, man, that guy needs to have a nervous breakdown that, you know, that guy <laughs> would do him so much good. Um, do you think your experiences contributed to that nervous breakdown? I mean, this is before you acknowledged them. Well, you know, this is, I, I talk about this and I'm very, and I, I did an interview ages ago with this woman, uh, Dr. Janet Coley or Colley. I, I, I think it's Dr. Colley. And she, um, Janet Elizabeth Colley, she's, she's amazing researcher and she, she, researches people who've been through trauma. She's a therapist. She's not really doing research. She's doing, you know, she's a therapist. She's helping people. Um, right. and I talked with her about it cause my very first bout of depression, I would have been about 12 years old. And I remember I was junior high school. I can't remember if it was seventh or eighth grade. I'll never figure that out. I don't think, but, but I remember just like there was a mood, there was a feeling there was, which is absolutely depression. I didn't have a name for it at the time, but I right. know what it is now. And, um, and, uh, and that was when I had my missing time event. Right. So, I mean, you can easily make the jump to the conclusion it would be a mistake to jump to the conclusion i think but i mean it's you know that it, it the, the timing is very very suspicious there and then yeah. i'll also say the event where i had the five beings in the yard which i which i saw in the winter of 93 is that right 92 93 yeah the winter of 93 um uh that was within within months of like the darkest chapter of my life that you know that would have been december of 92 and this was january or february of 93 when i saw those figures in the yard and i and i and i you know dr j i told this to dr coley and she kind of like you know i kind of like mused around it and kind of and she kind of like went oh golly you know like you could like ufos saved your life and i was like <laughs> well you know i mean Suicide was, I was kind of at that point, but at the same time, it's, it's, I'm cautious to make that leap. But again, the timing is very suspicious. You know, that, that, the, the, I had that encounter just as I was coming out of a very dark bout of depression. Yeah. Yeah. But it is interesting timing. It is very suspicious. Yes. Well, why, why not for the people who didn't hear the first time you were on? Uh, where you talked about your personal experiences, why don't you sum up some of the major points of your your personal experiences that that have brought you to this point? Yeah, and um, this is something, and, I've, and I, <laughs> I I I I need to. Oh gosh, I feel I've, I I sometimes I go on autopilot when I tell these stories, and I and I and I and I'm glad I wrote them down um, years ago because then I can go back and refer to like what I had written, and I am I'm proud of myself for for keeping pretty close to the events because I because I realize how easy it would be just to to twist them around twist if you didn't around, have it or just just not even out of a malicious way or like I'm not you know no it's how memory works yeah, so um that's that's the same with me I wrote down so much stuff and going back through my notes I, I'm 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 pleased with the fact that 
when I looked through my notes, I didn't see any glaring memory issues. You know, I wasn't like, I thought this happened, but it was really that. It was, it was really minor things that I remembered differently. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I find that what I do is I, I, I undertell it years later. And I look back at my original notes, and the, and the original story is much more dramatic. It's got more dramatic <laughs> I- events. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm kind of like undertelling it. I think I'm just polite by nature in some ways. And then I just like, oh, well, that's um, – but uh, – oh, my word. Um, so here I'll just tell the – so I hinted at the thing from 1993. So, so I was 30 years old uh, living in a cabin in Maine. I was alone, and um, I – uh, woke up in the middle of the night and there was a bright light shining in the window. Now also as a full disclosure, I had, I had a Bud Hopkins book intruders, like literally on the nightstand. I had been laying in bed, reading that, closed the book and then had this experience. So, so, you know, I mean, just factor that in any way you want. Uh, that's a book full of the scariest abduction kind of stories imaginable. Um, so I wake up, I, there's a bright light shining in the window. There's a, there's a motion sensor light out the window. So I was wondering like, is this something out there? And I sat up on my elbow and, and kind of looked out the window and, and the way the bed is pushed right up against the glass of the window. So it was really easy to look out the window. Um, and, uh, there were five gray aliens, classic, big bald heads, the big black eyes, the little spindly bodies, and they were walking towards the, 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 the house. Now, I should have, by all rights, like, freaked out and screamed and, 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 you know, locked the doors and grabbed a baseball bat or whatever, you know. I didn't. I just, I just was weirdly calm. Um, to say it was dreamlike would be correct. To say it was a dream, I, I don't think is correct. Uh, but so the, these, you know, this whole thing, I don't know how long it lasted, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, not that long. And I, I remember my, my, my focus was taken away from these beings that were really close to the window. Like it's like scary close to the window, like within a few feet of the window, or let's say a few yards of the window. And then um, just beyond them was this bright light. And that bright light wasn't a landed flying saucer or anything like that. It was, wasn't much bigger than, let's say, a, like a washing machine, but it was this bright light off in the trees. And there was kind of a little opening, a clearing there. And um, and I heard this voice in my head that was basically like, oh, yes, they're back. Now is the time to lay your head on the pillow and shut down. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. Boom, I was out in a millisecond. Now, now I, I dismissed it completely the next morning. Right, I got the book by Bud Hopkins on the table. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, I've just been through this sort of emotional crisis and just like, no way, no way. And I mean, like denied it. I never even bothered to look if there were any kind of footprints or marks in the snow outside the window. Um, well, I worked with Bud Hopkins a little bit and he asked me a question, which I thought was very wise. He said, how, how many times in your life have you like woken up and like seen a bright light out the window and looked like, looked out like that? I mean, is that the kind of thing you do? And I was like, no, I've never done that before. I'm like, okay. It's like how, you know, like if it was a dream, how often do you dream you're in your own bed? Like never, never have a dream. I'm in my own bed. <laughs> so he kind of went to this. Mm, okay. And, and, um, I went through a hypnosis process with Bud and it's on videotape and everything like that. So I have a record of it. it's incredibly boring to watch because, you know, like he's being very quiet and still and then I'm being very quiet and still. So there's long, long pauses between questions and answers. But um, uh, I, uh, the only thing that really came up, I mean, I told the story just as I told it to you now. The only thing that was very palpable in the hypnosis was the sense that these beings were back. And I kind of knew that in the moment, but it just felt like I, like I didn't have the, I didn't have permission to say that, you know, and under the relaxed hypnosis thing, I was like, Oh yeah, this is, that's interesting. There they are again. They're here. Yeah. It's them again. They're here again. They're back. There was that, that sensation, that feeling, um, under hypnosis. It doesn't make it true, but that was certainly the, the sensation I got. Okay. Um, and that and, and there's was, no owls in that story. So. Right. I know there's no owls in that story, but that, that was not the first experience you had. Well, I mean, I've had some other experience. I mean, I had bloody noses and stuff as a little kid and things like that. So, which is, did you have some missing time when you I were had a, a missing time event? I had one very profound missing time event that, that, um, took place in 1974. I was walking home from a high school football game. 
I was with a friend. His name was Mike also. It was a little neighborhood we lived in. You know, we were in junior high school and the high school was kind of just, you know, further down the road. And Friday night, that's what all the kids did. They went to the the high school football game and kind of hung out in the bleachers and stuff like that. So, you know, it's a total normal thing to do. And all the kids in school did it. And we walked to the high school football game and and um and then I wanted to be home, so I left the high school football game early with my friend because I wanted to see the television show Cole Shack the Night Stalker. <laughs> now there's a uh, there's I'll, I'll add this to the end here because it does get a little interesting. There so there's a um there was a spot on the sidewalk where we got to, and I could go there right now and put an X on that sidewalk that, that, that to the millimeter it feels like and, and exactly where I was standing, and um uh. At that point, like you know, clear, calm autumn evening in the in the Midwest, and and uh, there was this bright orange flash in the sky, and both of us were just like that was jarring. It felt like God flipped a light switch, click on, click off, just for one second, and the whole sky lit up, uniform, perfect orange. That and and even to this day, when I look at the coals of a of a campfire or you know something like that, I'm I'm like that that rich, self illuminating orange. Just, just that's exactly what it looked like. Now, I, um, and we both in the moment were like, oh, what was that? What just happened? It was really jarring. That's really weird. Was it a meteorite? Was it like an explosion over the horizon? Was it lightning? You know, none of these things matched. It was totally silent. And so I got home and my friend lived a little further in the neighborhood. So he walked, you know, he had to keep on walking. And I was the first house we passed. So I just went to my house and he, he walked on. Um, and, uh, my parents were angry at me. I'm like, well, what are you angry at me for? I didn't do anything wrong. Like, no, 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 it's, it's too late. You're, you can't be out late. I'm just like, not late. I'm here in time to see, I'm like a half hour early to see Cole Shack the Night Soccer. It should be about 9.30. And they're like, no, it's 11.30. And I was like, that didn't make any sense at all. And, I, and I'm, this is way before, you know, the term missing time had been coined. And, and, yeah. and uh, I was like, you know, my first thought was like, bummer, I missed that cool show. Um, <laughs> And then the next Monday at school, I remember sitting around with with the kids, and the the boy who was with me was there, and we were in the cafeteria and, and round table at the cafeteria, and one and, and um, I kind of said, you know, something weird happened on on uh, Friday night when we were walking home from the football game, and the guy I was with chimed up, and he just spoke up and blurted out, like, yeah, we saw a UFO with lights and everything. And I remember thinking right in the moment, like, ooh, that's how stories get blown out of proportion. He's lying. He's making this up. I never saw a UFO. Um, I've never asked him about, about this and I actually have, I'm in contact with him. I should, and it's just been one of these things that yeah. I've just put it off for so long now. It's like, you know, whatever it's, I, I, I need to do it before I, it's one on my, like a checklist on things to do in my life. I got to talk to this guy. But, um, <laughs> so, so as the years went on, I always had these two stories. I had, I had the orange flash story and then I had the missing time story. And I never even thought about it. And like, oh, that's right. I had that funny thing. I saw an orange flash. And then it's like, oh, yeah, I had that funny story where it's like I got home late and my parents were angry. I mean, I was reading UFO books and stuff like that. And, and um, there came a point, this must have been right around 2002 or one or so, probably 2002, I'm going to guess. Um, and there was a VHS copy of, of uh, the initial episodes of the X-Files at my video rental store. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and at the end of the VHS thing, there was like, and now, you know, an exclusive interview with series creator Chris Carter. And they had him there kind of sitting in his director chair. And he's like, you know, the television show that that I wanted to make, The X-Files, that my inspiration was a television show that I loved as a boy. And it was called Kolshak the Night Stalker. And I mean, right when he said that, you know, bam, these two memories just slammed together and, and. I was from that point on, like, I mean, I just remember I walked around the house like a, like a caged jaguar or something like that for the next half hour. Like, oh crap, that was the same night. That was the same night. And it was, I mean, what a corny thing, you know, like the the most pop culture UFO thing there can be is the X-Files. And that was the, that was the cause of me sort of realizing now there has since been a bunch of synchronicities surrounding this story where I now I'm just absolutely confirmed in my mind. Uh, you know, a girl, a girl in the neighborhood said that, you know, her neighbors reported in sometime in the mid-70s a UFO f- hovering right above that spot. Um, 
and uh, it was glowing green. They said glowing green UFO, and I've never got a chance to talk to those people. It's my understanding the neighbors have since died, but it was like kind of a, you know, they, they, she heard it from the neighbors, and so, um, uh, so there's this one. There's a lot of stuff that has come up connected to that. And and when do owls first make a, a notable appearance into your life? Now, did I tell the owl story? Because this is one that I tell so much, um, and I'm sure I I. You didn't tell you didn't tell it on these on this current show. Okay, you told it back in 2013. Okay, um, should I tell it again or just I'll make it? I'll yeah, try to do it just, quick so people can go back. Yeah, and, just give people the highlights because people can go back or read the book. This but is the problem. It's hard for me to give highlights because I just get so into it and I do. Oh, and then this happened and this happened. And so, um, okay, I'll do the highlights. Uh, went camping with a complete stranger in the town I was living in, 2006, October of 2006. Her name is Kristen. Curiously, the Kristen, Christopher, Christian, these names show up over and over again in the book in this really, like, weird way. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, it's like it's a normal thing to do, kind of an outdoor town, a ski town. is right near Grand Teton National Park. It's kind of, an, hey, let's go camping. Great, let's go. And you can just say that to a total stranger in the town. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So I, you know, so we went camping for one night, um, slept out under the stars. The weather was beautiful. You know, as uh, the sun was setting, I was talking to this woman, really a stranger in a way. I didn't really, didn't really know her at all. And, and, and she said, um, she was saying something that really impressed me. So, and, and, and right at that moment, an owl flew over us and a second owl and then a third owl. And, and for the next hour or so, these owls were flying above us, maybe two hours. And now that I think about it, the sun went set and got completely dark. We laid down on our backs under the sky, under the stars and, and the, and the, Owls would, as we were lying there in our sleeping bags, the owls would fly right above our face and blot out the sky for one second. Super cool. Really amazing. Um, uh, four days later, we go camping again. Basically, I say, hey, I love to go camping. I do this all the time. And she's like, great. If you do it again, call me. So I call her and we go out one more time. This time, same thing happens. Sunset, owls. This time, they land so close to us. It's a totally different part of the mountain range. I'm convinced it's the same three owls. Short ear owls. It's a very common, fairly big owl um, in the northern Rockies there, and uh, and I was, it was just, you know, these things were landing at our, I mean, not quite at our feet, not close enough that you could touch, but close enough you could like poke them with a pool cue, you know. So they were that close, landing near us, like looking up at us. Like it was to have it happen once was pretty cool. To have it happen twice in four days with the same person was like so eerie. Uh, now, years later, I wrote this up as a, as a blog entry and I posted it online. And right after I posted it, I said, you know, because I even said it right in the blog. I said, you know, in the, in the story, it's a great little story, right? It's tidy. It's got a, you know, little punchline and stuff like that. These owls happen twice. And so I get a hold of Kristen because I wanted to ask her, like she had since moved out of town. So that, that event happened in 2006. This blog entry was posted in 2009. So three years later, and I, I get a hold of her and I call her up and I say, hey, listen, like, I, do you remember what we were talking about with the first night when the first owls showed up? Because I, I, my memory was you were saying something that kind of impressed me. And she said, oh, yes, I remember exactly what I was saying. I was giving my deepest, most heartfelt definition of what God meant to me. Hmm. And that took this already mystical experience and just made it transcended it freaked me out i mean i kind of flipped out you know like i kind of lost my mind a little bit and i was like oh my god this is like what does this mean now this is something i never talked about at the time but i'll, I'll and i've said it in the book and I'm, I'm saying it now is that when i saw those owls i mean these are real owls they're the you know they're 10 right. inches tall and they're you know they're flying around and they're you know they're on little branches and stuff like that so it's not a screen memory of a gray alien and I, I kind of went through the little, I'd been reading UFO books, but, you know, uh, and I kind of gave them the little once over, you know, like, is this a screen memory? Uh, but, but I'll tell you what it was. So in my head, I heard the very clear, like, commanding voice that said, this has something to do with the UFOs. And so right in the moment, I knew they were intertwined. Just there was a voice it might have been my own voice. It might have been some inner knowing. But I mean, let me tell you, it was not. It was not kind of ethereal and willy nilly off in the ether. I mean, this was like in my mind, clear as bell. Like looking at these owls, it was like, oh shit, this has something to do with UFOs. Oh, so yes, so that was the initial thing. 
August or excuse me, October of 2006. From that point on, I, for the next couple of years, I sort of lost my mind. I was seeing so many UFOs. Excuse me, this is, I do this all the time. I, I mix up UFOs and owls. I was seeing so many owls and had so many synchronicities. It was, it was really freaking me out. 2009 was the, was the, was the sort of height of the bell curve of all this stuff. And I, I surprised I came out of it with my sanity intact. But, um, so that event was what set me on the path. And, and most of what I did from that point on was, you know, I'm mean, just like Google research, right? You look up totem animals and owls and, but what I was doing was asking people who've had UFO experiences. I would ask them the question, which nobody really was asking at that point was, have you ever had any odd experiences with owls? And, and the answers to that one question make up the majority of this book. And the next book. And the next book, and the follow-up book, yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things you deal in here is how owls are also a symbol of death. And you have, with UFO abductions, also the connection that, that Whitley Strieber has been really kind of pushing for a while now is that there's something, whereas uh, Ann Strieber, I think, put it that the UFO abduction experience has something to do with death. Absolutely, and yeah. So, you have both things connected to death in, in sort of different ways. Owls is sort of the totem of death or a bad omen or something like that. But you also have, you know, uh, experiencing people who have been deceased during abduction accounts. Yep. And, and it's interesting because the, the people would, the, yeah, the death thing shows up with the abduction accounts. Now, I've actually never heard any stories, any firsthand stories of, of people showing up. But that, that I've certainly read plenty of them, but I've never talked to anyone first person who's had like a, a dead relative show up. Um, but, uh, and, and what, when I also don't have any, like, well, I guess I've got a couple, I've got a couple that, that, that are, but very few of owls showing up before someone died, right? Someone will see an owl and like, oh crap, you know, here, and then some later they find out like someone close in their family has died. I'm only got, right, right. That's only happened a so couple we, times. A couple times. Yeah, it's always, it's always afterwards. It seems to be, not always, but, but the majority seem to be afterwards. And they seem to be very profound kind of, um, oh, how, you know, like really like life affirming or, or you know, like it gives people a remarkable amount of faith. And so, I mean, the oh, one woman, um, there was a guy, Lon Friend. He's a rock and roll journalist out of Los Angeles. He is his. You know that 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 amused the hell out of me when I read that because literally a few minutes earlier I had been flipping through some old CDs, looking for something to uh, to listen to while I read your book, and one of the CDs I picked up was a compilation that Lon used to put out for radio, back in the early nineties, that I didn't even know I still had. Oh my god! Okay, so this is like. This is so, I mean, I cannot even tell you, this is like so perfect. Now, Lon, oh my God, the, the, like the Lon friend thing, like it's like I've like the six degrees of separation. I've got, I've met so many people who know him, like, but not, I've never met him, but like, oh, this. I've is, never, I've never met him. I've never talked to him, but I've known about him forever because he used to, you know, work stuff to radio. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, he, I talked to him at length for, you know, I interviewed him for a long time for this and he was super supportive. So, so Lon friend. Uh, he, um, his mother died and afterwards he had all these owl synchronicities, you know, owls hooting out his window, um, and, and oak, uh, symbolism, oak trees. The hospital his mother died was, uh, uh, in Thousand Oaks, California. And it just went on and on and all these oak things that were showing up, so, but also owl things. And, um, the night, the night his mother died, he spent the night at his mother's home and out the window was an owl in an oak tree, you know, hooting. So, so he was kind of primed for this owl thing. And then, so his mother and his mother's sister, which would have been his aunt. So his mother and his aunt were, were born 11 years apart and they died 11 days apart. So his cousin, his cousin, Jill it was her mother that died. And there came a point when Jill had this conversation. It was just like, oh my gosh, I'm grieving. I'm grieving. I, my mom's gone. I'm, I, I just need a sign to know that everything's okay. I just need this. And, and a close friend of hers said, you know, like, don't worry, it'll come. The sign will come. And that night, she goes into the garage. And, and excuse me, I think it was early in the morning. She goes into the garage in the morning and pushes a bucket aside on the shelf. And, and, uh, 
And there was a little owl, a little screech owl behind this bucket and just staring at her. Now, the, 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 the garage is mostly full of her husband's stuff. And she basically said, I only have one shelf that's mine. And this is the one shelf. And, and, uh, and then her, and that was the one shelf the owl was on. She didn't know how it got in there. The, the garage door was closed. She'd been in, she'd been, this is in Florida. She'd been living in Florida for like 27 years. Never once seen an owl, sees the owl within hours of her saying like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grieving and I need a sign. Now she did something that I so common. She talked to the owl as if it was her mother. She even got on the phone, took a picture, called Lon, Lon friend, talked to him on the phone and, and like spoke to the owl and said, you know, um, mom, it's Lonnie. I'm talking to, I'm talking to Lonnie's on the phone now. And, uh, I wanted so badly. I really like. I wanted this to be true. I actually wrote it down because I thought I remembered it. And I had to call Lon and I had to edit it out of the book. I was like, "Dang, that would have been so good." But my memory was that she had held the phone up to the owl's ear, and like mm. let Lonnie talk to the owl. But Lonnie said, "No, no, that didn't happen." Lon friend said that didn't happen. But that would really bum me out. I wanted that in the book, but it didn't happen. So, <laughs> um, had to, yeah. So, but uh, had had to go with reality. Uh, oh God, I can't remember how I. I actually typed it in there, and I was like, "Dang, this was good." So. Um, so then, sh then, you know, that was, the, that was Thanksgiving morning and then Lon, wait, where am I going with this? Oh, so, so later that night, excuse me, Jill, the daughter of the mother that died, uh, sh she actually, the, the owl was still in the garage that night. She went out in the garage and said, mom, I get it. I got the message. You can go now. Thank you. I love you. I appreciate that you came and shared this, but you know, you, you have to go now. And then the owl flew off. Uh, and so people, t I got a, one after another accounts of people talking to owls as if they are their dead parents or dead relatives or dead spouse. Um, and I actually have someone who, who, who talked to the, you know, there was an owl on the back porch right after their dog died. And they went out to the back porch and talked to the owl as if it was, you know, their, their dog and said, thank you for coming back and visiting. You know, I miss you. Um, now, this is where things get really weird. This is the synchronicity aspect. I, I, this is like this. So Lon's mother died. Lon's mother's sister died 11 days later. My mother died 11 days before Lon's mother died. So there's this tidy, like you put it on a, on a, on a, you know, you count it out. It's 11, 11. Right. And, um, that just was like when, you know, like, ha. Huh? How do you, how do you, you know, who's the script writer of reality that, that like, that, that put that in there, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's powerful for me. I mean, that's, I mean, I feel like I have a very real responsibility to these, to these stories and the people who've had these experiences. Um, one of the things you deal with in here that uh, I'm not sure entirely what to make of is the idea of reverse speech revealing stuff and i'm not sure what to make of it either now now so there's this guy that so there's a few reverse speech therapists and and uh you know one of them wouldn't answer my calls i mean i didn't try very hard i mean i kind of I, I got a hold of him and, and he does ufo research and reverse speech analysis um and then this the guy that i talked to wayne nicholson's great guy amazing guy um, I had heard him on Whitley Strieber's show, and Whitley had these amazing things that kind of emerged out of the reverse speech. And I should actually post that online. I, that's one of the things I need to do because because I have the copies of the reverse speech. Some of them are a little garbled, right? You got to kind of, I don't know how do you say, squint your ears. I, that's not right. You got to listen carefully, and and <laughs> uh, and and you can you can perceive these little messages coming out of these things. Um, here, let me just open the book, and I'll, I'll read a few. But um. So, so, so what happens is this fellow recorded my voice forward and then, uh, I, he just was like, I talked to him for about 45 minutes. He's like, yeah, just keep on talking, talk. And I was like, ah, this owl research, this stuff is going on. And, and, um, uh, and then at the end he, you know, he kind of went through and listened to the whole conversations backwards and listened to what emerged. And the, the, what emerged was these little teeny kind of, I don't know, like Zen Cohen's would kind of leap out of these things. And, and for the most part, they're pretty clear, you know. Um, 
So here, I'll just I'll just read it. So so one of the things I'm talking in, in, in forward, I say, the intensity seems like it could be too much at times. So I'm wondering. And that was the research. That was the stuff in my life. That was what I just talked about earlier, you know, like where I was felt like I was overwhelmed for a number of years. So forward, I said, the intensity seems like it could be too much at times. So I'm wondering. And from that, you know, it's a little bit kind of garbly, but you could cl very clearly hear my own voice saying, you're no mouse. Which is, which to me is kind of a call to be brave. And I took that as kind of like a, you know, like, wow, that is, that's, that's very reassuring for me. But it, at the same time though, couldn't you, I mean, aren't you going to hear something eventually? You know what I mean? Like, just, yep. Just yep. With our speech patterns, eventually something's going to come up and then you can be like, ooh, look, something. So is there really value in it or are we just reading into it? I think we're, it's, I think there's both. I think there's really value in it. And I think there's really, you know, there's, there, are you reading into the tarot deck, right? I mean, is there value to it or is it just sure. kind of like you sure. just, I mean, okay. yeah. So, I mean, are you just reading into it, you know? Yeah, I, that's a perfect question. I don't have an answer. It was valuable to me. So, so okay. here, so I'm going to go way to the end of the book here. And then there's a couple that like, I, um, I, uh, okay. So these are the two that kind of blew my mind. Okay. So th there's this confirmation event that took place that took, that takes like a half hour to tell. It just goes on and on. This is the last 40 pages of the book. It's just all right. this stuff. This is the psychic thing with a UFO sighting or a, in lines on a map. And it just, I just had to play self-detective and make sense of all this stuff. So, but there was the, the confirmation thing for me, which is what I say, my confirmation event was lining that stuff up on the map. So that's forward. I told that to, to Wayne Nicholson and reverse very clearly. You can hear my voice saying many owls. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't, I mean, God, come on. It doesn't get any clearer than that, you know, like my, and then, um, and then also, um, and this was, this is almost, I almost ended the book on this one. It's just, there's like one page left of the book pretty much after this, I guess there's a little bit of a conclusion, but the, um, so I talked about the night, the, this confirmation event, which I talked, you know, I said earlier that I sleep out under the stars and I try to do that a lot. And, um, I slept out, there's an event that took place on March 10th, 2013, where I slept out under the stars. And this is okay, people, go buy the book, because I don't, we don't, we'll, if, we'll have to do a third show if you want me to tell this story. <laughs> so, but, um, so I basically saw something unusual that night, and all this synchronistic stuff was tied into it. So, but forward, I was talking to Wayne Nicholson, I said, forward, I said, I was in Utah, and it was a cold night, and I had a big sleeping bag, and I slept under, out under the stars. Now, reversal, it was, he knows to surrender. Now that won't mean anything to anyone but me. And that was so powerful for me. That, and I never said it in any of the books. Maybe I've written it online a little bit. But I mean, when I sleep out under the stars, it is almost like a, like a mystical act of surrendering. And that is, that is, and I never said that to Wayne Nicholson forward, but it came out in reverse. Um, and so that just, you know, he knows to surrender. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, that <laughs> just hit me so perfectly and so cleanly. There was like 35 little speech reversals and he's good at it. I mean, he's a pro. He was like, you know, let's just dismiss this one. This really kind of plays out. It's kind of there. It doesn't really mean anything. doesn't ring anything for you. Let's just drop it and move on. So there was, you know, 35, maybe 10 of them were like home runs, uh, so I'm not sure what to make of it. You know, it's interesting because I initially wasn't going to put that chapter in and I, and I had it in the thing and I just remember sending Nick Redfern did the very first, um, like editing of the book. And I was, I just said, Nick, don't worry about commas. I just want to know about the content, you know, should something stay, should something go? And I said, what about the reverse, reverse speech chapter? Does that stay or does that go? He's like, Oh no, you got to leave that one in. And cause I was, I just thought it, it was too far out. It kind of was like outside right. the boundary of the book in a way. And then, and, and then Rich was like, Oh God, I can't believe you went for that. You know, we got to leave it in you. Like who, who, you know, like, like basically Rich was saying like, you know, like, I don't know anyone who would, who would have the nerve to put that in a book. And yeah. You know. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, and, and, um, the, and now here's the weird part. So the, and I'm not going to say anything here. I haven't been given permission to say, you know, so Wayne Nicholson, at the end of this whole thing and the thing's like, well, now Mike, um, I know you're doing this research in this UFO stuff. I have some questions to ask you. And then he went to tell me some stories 
none of them had a flying UFO in the sky. He did tell me a story of a, of a driving home from work and seeing, um, you know, the big water towers? He described yeah. this big onion-shaped water tower. So he drives past the water tower and it gets hit by lightning and it like lights up this electric blue and it just like, and, and, and it just out of a clear blue sky, this lightning bolt hits the water tower and everyone on the, you know, like everyone should have stopped, but like the traffic just moseyed along and no one even seemed to notice it. He was like, wow, that cannot believe that happened. So the next day he's on his way to work and drives past that spot. There's, there's no water tower. Comes home <laughs> that night, there's no water tower. And, and he, he, and then he he goes to the town, you know, like whatever the county commissioners, and looks at the old maps and like, what's where's the water tower that should be at this corner right here? And I'm like, there's never been a water tower. There's no water tower there. So, how do you? How do you? I mean, this is the guy doing the reverse speech analysis. I mean, to me, right. I, I call him one of the maybe people. I'm very cautious. I, I know what it feels like to have someone say, "Oh, you're you've had these experiences. You've had UFO experiences." If you're not ready for that, it's not my job to like spring it on you. So, so that's a very personal thing. They gotta, you know. So, I can't say what Wayne had experienced. All I can say is that that is so curiously typical of the people who are engaged in these kind of outlying activities. You know, like Reiki therapists and reverse speech therapists and 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 the like, psychics. Hmm. So, has anything happened since you published the book? Um, what has happened is I am getting flooded with, and I love them. And please, if people have something, send it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying it's bad. I am getting flooded with, with, and I feel honored to be flooded with with um, accounts, amazing accounts. I'm basically getting about one a day, a UFO account in combination with an owl or some mystical owl account um it is it is like i can't i mean that's like i can't keep up with it you know like i, I apologize to people like in advance on this thing here just because i can't you know like i try my best to get back to everyone at least i give them a little note says right. thanks got the email but um it's in some of them have are so transcendently beautiful uh, it's 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 hard to so that's happened. I mean, that's happened. The book has been, has taken, you know, my little, you know, it's not that popular of a book. It's selling pretty well. And Rich Dolan, the publisher, is very happy with the way it's selling. But um, it's this kind of, I guess, modest book. It's my own little story. And then, in, but it has, it's given people a, a, like it's, you know, I'm very easy to get a hold of. It's easy to find my email address. And, and, and I'm at the receiving end of, these magical accounts. So that's happened. That's certainly happened. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Um, and the book, is, it's, it's, it's honestly different than anything that's ever been written about this stuff before. And, and I, I guess I, I have to thank you for saying that. And I didn't set out to write something different. You know, I think I told you, I'm not sure if I said this the other night, you know, what I set out to do in a way was to write the book that I always wanted to read. Yes. Yes, you did. Well, the thing is, it's your own story, so that that's part one. So no one's story is going to be quite like yours. But the way you you have approached these seemingly different subjects and tied them together in, in this perfect way to show how they're they're all either connected or possibly the same thing is something that has been well needed. Um, you know, it's easy and it, it you. I don't know how to put this. It's easy enough to say they are, but you show over and over again how these things merge into one another. And and it's interesting because I because it, it, I feel like I'm a you know I'm an artist or an illustrator by trade. So so like you like you set these two stories side by side, and they're different. Like you know I'll compare and contrast yeah. two stories. They'll be different stories. Obviously they're different stories, but they're they're similar in tone, or in mood. You know, maybe some key elements will be the same. But I, I really felt that I was able to tap into, like, the mood of a story and recognize that the that the mood is the same. And I think, like, a, you would have a hard time, uh, like, going through MUFON files and looking at a, at a, at a written-up document and <laughs> trying to figure out the mood of that document. And I was yeah. very, very concerned with the, the flavor and the tone and the emotional mood of these things. The... Um... No, the book is excellent. It it really is. You you're 
Um, it's up there as, as I think a book that years from now people are going to look back at and realize had at least added a, a significant piece to this whole puzzle. You know, I, it, it is a future classic. And, and I, I and I, say. and I like, yeah, yeah, like I'm very modest and, and like, yeah, that's, 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 I'm going to like, you know, walk around the block with my, you know, my Danish Protestant upbringing, you know, kind of ringing the bell there and saying like, well, that's very nice that you say that, but golly gee, like, uh, yeah. So I'm going to try to be as gracious as possible. That is wonderful for me to hear. And, 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 and I'm, you know, honored that you would say something so, so complimentary. And, and it's honest. I wouldn't say it if I didn't mean it. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to your next book with uh, some of these longer stories because you give the little bits in here and then you'll you'll put a little note. This will be in the you know the full version will be in the next book and I'm th- thinking, but I want the full version now. Well, that was it's really tough because it's like if I gave you the full version now, the book you'd have to like you know whatever you 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 know eight nine hundred pages. Yeah, it would be long. It would be long. It would be it wouldn't wouldn't serve anyone to put a book on the shelf that was six six hundred pages. You know so. Um, <laughs> But it's, um, yeah, the book I'm working on is actually, and it's funny because I'm kind of in the middle of it sometimes and you kind of just like, it just turns into work, right? Now I got to write this essay and I, I'm working with this friend of mine. Her name is Suzanne Chancellor and she's kind of editing these things. And we, we really like go over like every paragraph and every word sometimes. And she's like, what about this word? Mm. So it feels like it's got this, like it's like, it feels really buttoned up, you know, it feels really clean and, and tidy, you know, where it's, but you know, at the same time, it's like we have all the space we need. So we don't have to, you know, if there's like an interesting aspect to some story, that's a problem with like, you know, writing a book in a way where, where you have, I mean, there's hundreds of accounts in this book. And if I, if I, if every single one of them could be its own novel. So I simply right. couldn't, you know, there's, oh God, this guy, Alan Cavernous, the story that, that he, that's in there for his, my God, that just was like unending. And, and, uh, and I feel like I did a really good job of boiling that down to its bare minimum where you could still get the flavor of, of the story. Um, you know, he saw an owl, uh, when he was, um, uh, like out his rear view or he passed an owl on the road and he's, he's also doing UFO research. And on the same night that he saw an owl, someone else saw deer under equally weird circumstances. And on the same night that someone else saw UFO, and then they realized that the person who saw the deer and the person who saw the UFO work in the same building at the same office, but don't know each other. And it just went on and on and on and on. Just like this stuff just got so tied into, and, and then, uh, and Alan Kavanagh is, very clear that he's an experiencer has had his own direct contact experiences. And so this is, this is like the, I, I use the term, which I made up and, and I, and it doesn't really mean anything. I called it the paradox syndrome, which is kind of like, kind of, it sounds lofty and, but it, but what I was trying to say is there's a, there's like a paradox that these stories don't make any sense. But at the same time, that that chaotic, confusing, threads leading everywhere, you know, you pull on them and and it leads to more synchronicities. That 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 flavor, that tone of these longer stories, to me, is a form of confirmation because I've heard stories with that flavor so often that I recognize that 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 you know where there's smoke, there's fire. That to me says like, oh, this is a genuine event. You know, the the question is, you know, who's the what's at the source? What's the, what's the axle? What's the hub on the wheel that all these synchronicities and all these odd events are being generated from? I don't have an answer to that, but all I can say is that there's this tangle of, of synchronistic weirdness surrounding many of these stories. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like they're connected in a way we can't see, but the connection's there. And it's just beyond us completely. So, so here I'm just gonna the one. There's this is Rich. I thought was gonna fall out of his chair when I told him this. So we did. You know, there's this big long book, and it goes on and on and on, and it's 400 pages. And and there's this one story that um, that Richard Dolan turned me on to. He said, "Oh, there's this one person you need to talk to. She's got this story." And that was the story where the woman um, uh, kept on seeing 333, and she then she saw a, a triangle shaped UFO. And then right. she was doing um, um, astrology readings, and she had the book The Ephemeris. I think it's called an Ephemeris, which is like the the book that an astrologer would use, and it gives the the alignment in numerical digits of all the astrological 
you know, the moon, the stars, the sun. And on the day of the UFO sighting, the, the uh, ephemeris read that it was 333. That, that, was, the, that was the numerical um, number given to the sun on that day, which is the most important um, you know, thing in our, in our sky is the sun. So the sun had 333 on the day she saw a three-sided craft with three lights and three, um, three corners and three sides, 333. Um, she didn't. It didn't. It didn't hit home when she found the number three 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 in the ephemeris. It 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 happened later when she saw a catfish eating a cucumber, and the catfish in the in the in the aquarium, just as she was talking about, like I need to figure out what this number means. Like she saw the catfish had eaten a piece of cucumber in the perfect shape of a triangle. So, and then that's when she got the 333 and it all made sense. Not when she saw the 333 in the ephemeris, which I thought was really funny. And then if you turn to page, guess which page? 333 333 in the book. That's the culmination of her story is on page 333. Um, (laughs) And that was not intentional. Oh my God, when I told that to Rich, he's like, what? What? No way. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at this point, I I don't want to be cavalier, but I was like, you know, like, that's the first thing I do. I checked page page 333. I'm like, hey, what's going on there? What's what's going on in page? uh, If this book was 1,111 pages, I would have checked that page page too. But I checked um, that and 123. So, um, anything significant? No, nothing at all. Nothing at all. So, um, all right. Go on. Oh, no. Anyway, I'm just, I feel like I'm, this was, uh, uh, so yeah, so like, uh, I'm just like, how do you, how do you back engineer that? You know, how do you, how do you like <laughs> kind of say like, you know, you can, I, I just, it boggles my mind. But at the same point, this is the flavor, the tone of these, of some of these accounts. Yeah. It, I think it's a feedback loop in a sense. I mean, we feed into it. It feeds back to us. And you get more and more synchronicities and confirmations and things like that. The problem is it doesn't tell us what it's confirming. It does not tell us what it's confirming, but it does tell me that, um, I mean, in essence, it tells me pay attention. Pay yes. very close yeah, attention. I think, I think that, is a, that is something very valuable you have in there, that, that what this means to you is pay attention. And that is, I mean, something that, that I've always, you know, like I said, with synchronicities and things like that, it's always pay attention. Why is this happening? I'm going in the right way. You know, pay attention to what's going on. Yeah. And I mean, I've also heard, um, you know, you said signpost on the path. You know, the other way to look at yeah. it is, is um, the compass bearing on, a, on, a, on an open ocean on a cloudy day, right? You can't mm. get your bearing. So you have to use the compass. And so that to me is a... And I, and I met this, that to me works really well. I met this woman at a UFO conference. She's an experiencer. Her name is Dina Blatt. She's an amazing woman. Um, I haven't talked to her in a couple of years. Um, but she kind of pantomimed this thing. She had all these experiences and she's this funny, cute old lady. And she's like, she's like, uh, like saying, and then you pull on this thread and she's like standing there and she like pantomimes like she's pulling on this thread, you know, and then you get to the end of that thread and there's another synchronicity and you pull on that thread and she pantomimes pulling this thread. And at the end of the thread is your destiny. And it was so (laughs) dramatic when she said this to me and it really had an impact on me. Like I just really gotta, when you have a synchronicity, you gotta pull on it and figure out like what is going on. And I have been, I don't know, like shameless or on fire to do these things. You know, I'll just tell, I mean, I don't know if I'm going on and on here, but then we, we had, uh, my partner, Andrea and I had, had this guy over at our house. His name is Peter Manns. He's a German, I don't even know what you'd call him. He's a Reiki master, but he does this kind of thing he calls deli- divine alignment where he, um, uh, where he just basically does like spine therapy. He just basically lays you on a table and just stands over you and says, okay, now you're cured. And then people get up and they're like, Hey, you know, my back feels great. I haven't felt this good in years. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't touch. you. He doesn't like, you know, <laughs> just like, Oh wow, I feel great. So this is interesting guy, you know, and he's smart and, and kind of, you know, powerful character and, and, um, charismatic and everything. So he came to the house and he had no idea who I was. And I had met him briefly. We had him over for dinner and he was in this small town that we we're in. He was doing, um, you know, sessions here and uh and he's got his back up to the window and the window is up to the porch and i'm standing facing him and and i said oh i'm doing this research on owl this kind of mystical stuff about owls and spirituality and mythology and ufo sightings so that's interesting because i had a i had a 
um, a, a meeting with a, a Indian shaman, a medicine man. He he gave me like a reading, and he said he he was psychically seeing that I had an owl totem, and he said it was right here above my shoulder, above my head on the side, and he put his hand up and kind of showed where it was. Now he couldn't tell, but where I was standing in the living room, I was looking out the big window that goes to the porch. On the porch, we have a totem pole, and on the top of the totem pole is an owl, and where his hand was exactly bisected the owl. So he's saying, I have an owl totem here. What I'm seeing is an owl on a totem pole, like exactly where his hand was. I mean, I don't know where to go with this. I mean, it, that it just happens. <laughs> this happens so often. I, I'm, I'm, it's like it's, it, I, I just don't know what to make of it anymore. I mean, I, I, I obviously do. I try to archive it and write a little essay about it. I did a little right. blog post about that and such. But, you know, I, sh I mean, shouldn't I start a new religion or something? I don't know. That's probably a little too <laughs> too extreme. But yeah, I think that's that's going in the wrong. Way. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's I mean, it's it has that power. But I obviously, yeah, I'm not going to start a new religion. But um, well, you know, things like religions are dogmas, and you're looking for dynamic, open, you know, progression. Like I think the point of where people start religions is where things stop. <laughs> yeah, that's well said. Yeah. So, all right. And the 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 website is what? My website is uh, hiddenexperience.blogspot.com. All right. And the book is The Messengers: Owls, Synchronicity, and the UFO Abductee. You are Mike Cleland. With an exclamation. Point, Sometimes with an exclamation point. Yeah. <laughs> and I thank you, Mike. The book's excellent, as I've said numerous times, and uh, always great talking with you. Yes, this was a joy. All right, that was my conversation with Mike Cleland. Uh, patrons are going to get an extra 15 minutes or so where we talk about a few other things. Next week, Jeffrey Kripal will be coming on to talk about his new book, co-written with Whitley Strieber, called The Supernatural, two words. And that should be uh, that should be great. Um, Michael Hughes will be helping me with the hat, and lots of other fun stuff to come. Again, if you want to become a patron and help out the show, go to wheretheroadgo dot com for three bucks a month. You get some extra stuff, and it helps us out. And uh, hopefully, we're going to be able to do more and more as time progresses.